came across a website this week called Greenwise. Of course, as the name would indicate, it is a site that uh, promotes green type living. And so in one article I came across, it laid out five, uh, five uses for old furniture. Five things you can do with old furniture without throwing it away. So you can kind of reuse it, right? And the first was you can donate it. You can take it maybe to Goodwill, maybe uh, some other place that could use it. Uh, maybe you could donate it uh, to so- someone out there, a lowly college student who doesn't really care what they sit on. I'll never forget in my apartment when I was in college, we had this big yellow sofa. And I'm not sure where it had come from, but I'm fairly certain it was at least decades old. But what I loved about it is I could lay down. It was so long, I could lay down, and I had probably a good 18 inches left of space, and I could stretch out completely, and that was nice. And I liked that, and I'll never forget one of my roommates said, I love this sofa so much, I'm taking this with me when I get married. His name's Brett. Ask that how that was going for him. (laughs) That never happened. But anyway, so so someone had given us that sofa. That was nice. The second second thing you can do with old furniture is sell it. Sell it. And you'd be amazed. You say, Pastor, nobody wants my old furniture. You would be amazed. (laughs) Stick a sign out front that says yard sale. Man, you could put anything out there and people come and buy it. (laughs) So sell it. There's also kind of a... This is a little bit of a, of a new term, maybe, coin, I don't know if it was coined by HGTV, but at the very least they made it popular, repurpose it, right? make a new purpose. I don't know if that's kind of like regifting, uh, not quite the same, but you repurpose it. And in what, <laughs> under repurpose, it had some bullet points of examples. One of the examples was uh, an old ladder that you can now use that to hang towels on. I could just see it right now, Pastor Micah. Hey, babe, to, to my bride, I've got this old aluminum ladder with paint splattered all over it. I'm going to stick it in the bathroom. We're going to start hanging towels on it. I can see how that would go. There's another uh, one that was uh, refinish it. Refinish it. How many of you have refinished furniture? Now, we've done that. And, and thank, used to you had to sand everything down and you repaint it or whatever. Now you antique it, right? which means now you can paint it and don't have to do anything to it because you want it to look old and beat up. And there's paint out there, antiquing paint. Several years ago, my wife introduced me to something called Annie Sloan paint. And I call it anything from Susie May to Annie May, but it's Annie Sloan paint. Now listen, that is a Greek phrase for paint that costs a whole bunch of money. I will say this, though. We got a little bitty, like a, like a seven-ounce can or eight-ounce can or whatever it was. And, and I must have painted three or four different pieces of furniture and a door with that. So it was good paint. But it, it kind of helped us to repurpose some pieces of furniture that we used. And then the final, the final idea is to recycle. Recycle. You've got a, a wood piece of furniture. You could break that thing up and take it down uh, to the recycling place, or you've got furniture made out of certain materials, you could take it down to the recycling place. Either way, when you do this with your furniture, you get good use out of it. Instead of just throwing it away, you become uh, someone who uses your furniture much more efficiently. To use something efficiently means you get the, the greatest extent of use with the least amount of expenditure. And so one piece of furniture might be able to be used in multiple ways uh, rather than getting a piece of furniture, using it, throwing it away, and getting new that expends a lot more materials, a lot more effort, a lot more energy. Years ago, I began to coin this term for God. and I don't, Well, I don't know if it's coining the term, but I've been to use this phrase about God. Some of you have heard me use it, that God is a very efficient God. It's very efficient. In fact, one thing I've learned about God is He will not waste anything in our lives. And when we are walking through a situation, maybe whatever you're walking through right now, 
Maybe it's a difficult situation. Maybe it's a challenging situation. Maybe it's a joyful situation. Maybe it's an easy situation. But whatever the circumstance might be, make no mistake about it. If you walk with God and you allow him, he will use your situation in ways you never could have conceived of. Ladies and gentlemen, here's our primary thought. God will not waste our past experiences, but he will use them to glorify himself and to proclaim his name. God will not waste our past experiences. He will use them. He will use them to magnify himself, to glorify them. He will use them to reach the lost. He will use them to equip the saved. And this morning, that's what we want to consider, that is the Efficient sovereignty of God. God's efficient sovereignty. So there are three words here, God, that you are familiar with, hopefully. Efficient, which means taking something and using it to its most effective means with the smallest expenditure of effort or energy. Efficient. Some of you are like that with with money. You are very efficient with money. Well, when you have $1,000, you can do a lot more with it than when other people have $1,000 because you're very efficient in the way you spend it or save it or use it in in sales. And there are people you've seen who can take uh, 100 bucks and buy $300 worth of groceries because of their effective use of coupons. It's very efficient, right? God's very efficient and His sovereignty. Sovereignty means this, God controls absolutely everything all the time. Just that He is in control. So whatever's happening in your life, if you thought that you are the victim of circumstance, then you do not fully have an appreciation for the sovereignty of God. As Christians, this is good news, as Christians, we are never the victims of circumstance. We are never victims. Do not act like it. Stop treating yourself like it. Stop treating other people. As believers, we're not victims, if I, was a, if I were a victim, that means God, someone's doing something to me that, that somehow God was not aware of. But if, if something's happening and on the outside it appears it's being done to me or it appears it's being done against me, I have to assume that, okay, God allowed it and I don't know what, but he's going to do something with this for his glory. He's efficient and he's sovereign and that's what we're going to consider today. God's efficient sovereignty. And so... What are some experiences God might use in your life? What are some past experiences God might use in your life? If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to the book of Acts. We are there again, Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter 21. In your Bible or your iPad or your iPhone or your smartphone, Whatever your copy of the scripture is on today, you turn there to Acts 21. Specifically, we will be covering today verse 37 of chapter 21 all the way through verse 29 of chapter 22. I know some of you are going, likely story, Pastor. There's no way that happens today. I'm telling you it's going to. It's going to. If this were Wednesday night or Sunday night, I probably couldn't promise it. But I'm telling you it will today. And so here's here's where we are in the book of Acts. Paul has returned from his third missionary journey, right? He has come back with an offering for the church in Jerusalem. He has already met with the leaders in the church in Jerusalem. He has met with them to tell them his story of reaching the Gentiles. And some of you have have seen this map through the weeks. And uh, it's, it's familiar to you. As Paul meets with the leaders in the church in Jerusalem, he tells them about all the Gentiles who have been saved, and they celebrate. Then they tell him about in Jerusalem all the Jews who have been saved, and they celebrate. And then they say, but Paul, there's some bad news. Some of the Jews who have been saved here in Jerusalem, and literally there are thousands of Jews who have been converted to Christ in Jerusalem. And so they say, Paul, out of all these, these Jews who have been saved and come to Christ, many of them have been told and have heard that when you go out and win Jews to Christ, you then start telling them to stop being Jewish. The rumor, Paul, among these new Jewish believers 
is that you are trying to dissuade born-again Jews to stop uh, being Jewish. (laughs) And, of course, if you follow Paul's ministry, nothing could be farther from the truth. And they said, so here's what we're going to do. Paul, we want you to join several other guys we have in the temple to fulfill a vow to which they have committed. And if you'll be involved in that, we think that will settle the mind of the Jewish born-again believers. And so Paul does that. He he, uh, meets up with this group of guys. They go to the temple. Paul pays their fees to finish their vow. And for six days, Paul is involved with them in finishing up this vow. And best we can tell, these Jewish converts, these born-again Jewish believers in Jerusalem were satisfied. And they begin to see Paul, okay, he's born again, but he's also doing Jewish things. So it appears to us that rumor was not true. And just a note I bring up again, Paul did something that quite honestly he didn't have to do. Paul had not done anything wrong. And yet he went out of his way to do something he didn't have to do because he was more concerned about the church and its health and the gospel. And even though he could have said, Guys, I'm, I'm not doing that. I'm not joining up with I'm not going to pay their fees and do all this. These people should stop believing rumors, and I'm not going to do it. And he would have been well within his quote-unquote rights to do that. But instead, he said, you know what? I'm, I'm more concerned about the gospel. So if the leaders of the church in Jerusalem are asking me to take these steps, I'm going to do it. Even if, even if he didn't necessarily uh, agree with the rumor, whatever, but he, he was more concerned about the church. So he did that. And while he was in the temple, there were some Jews, not Jewish Christians, but lost Jewish people who had come all the way from Asia. Now, we, we, we believe pretty much that they came from Ephesus, which was in the area of Asia Minor. They had come all the way from Asia to celebrate the festival in Jerusalem, and they showed up in Jerusalem, these Jewish unbelievers, and they came into the temple area, and guess who they saw? They saw Paul. Well, the last time they had seen Paul, they were running him out of Ephesus for creating a store, a stir there with the gospel. So these Asia, Asian uh, unbelieving Jews or non-Christian Jews show up in Jerusalem thousands of miles away. They see Paul, and they see Paul with somebody they know. It's a guy named Trophimus who was from Ephesus. So they see Paul with Trophimus. They see Paul in the temple. They saw Paul with Trophimus down in the marketplace in Jerusalem. And then later they saw Paul at the temple. So not only did these Jewish unbelievers begin to continue to propagate the rumor that Paul was trying to discourage Jews from being Jews, (coughs) they said something else that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. And it was that Paul had brought a Gentile into the temple, which I mentioned this last week. We covered all this last week, but I mentioned that's a stupid rumor because if Paul had done that, he probably would have been assaulted on sight. (laughs) He never would have made it into the temple. Anyway, so here's Paul, and the rumor begins about him, and we pick up here um, in verse 26. Or excuse me, 30, 36. We'll, we'll start around there. And uh, that's where we finished up last week. Verse 36, I'm going to read. Our study begins really in verse 37. <coughs> but verse 36 says, For the multitude of the people followed after, crying out, Away with him! And so that's where we ended last week. Paul has been arrested. Paul is being carted off. In fact, the the Roman authorities had to get involved because the crowd got so crazy. They arrest Paul. And we pick up today in 37. In verse 37, all the way through chapter 22 and verse 29, we are going to see some things that, that come up from Paul's past that actually are used here to spread the gospel. What are some past experiences in your life? that God might use. As I often say, this is not an exhaustive list of everything in your past that God might use because I'm going to share with you some things today and I'm sure there are even other things that God might use from your past, but here are a few examples of how God uses things from our past 
now to, to do his work in today or even in our future. Verse 37 of chapter 21. Then as Paul was about to be led into the barracks. So there is a barracks on the edge of the temple that the Romans kept a, uh, a guard there. They kept a presence even on the temple mount, which could get a little hairy, get a little crazy at times. So they were about to carry him into the barracks. And he says, may I speak to you, he replied, or may I speak to you? And the commander replied, can you speak Greek? Now, up to this point, they weren't aware of who Paul was. In fact, we're going to find out most of the people in the crowd don't even know why they're mad at Paul. And the commander and the soldiers, they don't even really know what's going on or why Paul is here or why the people are rioting. They just figure that these people are rioting over this guy, Paul. He must have done something wrong. They think he is a Jewish revolutionary. We're going to see that here later on. And so when he speaks Greek, they're like, whoa, hang on. You speak Greek? Look at verse 38. The commander says, are you not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a rebellion and led the 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? Now think about this. This is the apostle Paul. Paul and his 4,000 assassins, right? That's crazy. That's ridiculous. Last two weeks, by the way, we've looked at messages that have addressed the concern and the damage and the destruction that rumor and gossip causes, right? And God bless you. Some of you all came up to me afterwards and said, Pastor, I just want you to know you're talking to me. And I said, listen, I would never have known you had that issue if you hadn't just told me. So I'm just saying. But rumor, gossip, I mean, we've all been in situations where we've said things and we go, you know what? I, I shouldn't have said that. We've all been there. But in this case, it is kind of that on steroids. And now the rumor, that, that it's kind of like that, that game you play where you, tell the, you get in a circle, you know, you tell the first person one thing, and then he tells the next person the next person. You go all the way around the circle, and by the time it gets back to the original person, it's something completely different than where it started. That's what's happening here. These Roman centurions, these Roman soldiers, these Roman commanders, they thought Paul was some kind of an assassin. <laughs> That's funny. And so verse 39, but Paul said, I'm a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia. And then he makes a statement. I love this. A citizen of no mean city. That did not mean like uh, mad and angry and unkind. Mean like small. The city that I came out of, it ain't small. It's, it's a significant city. And that's important here. I implore you to permit me to speak to the people. So... The, the commander gives Paul permission. So when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs and motioned with his hands to the people. And when there was a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, saying, Paul's there. Paul spoke in Greek to the commander. He spoke in Hebrew to the people. When he spoke in Greek, it got the commander's attention and really gave Paul an opportunity to be heard. If Paul had not spoken in Greek, if Paul had not mentioned the city he was from, I'm not really sure he would have been given the opportunity to speak as he is. And then as he begins to speak to the, to the rioting crowd of Jews, I'm not really sure they would have listened if he weren't speaking in Hebrew. I'm not saying a lot of the people in the riot didn't know Greek. They probably did. But when Paul began to speak to them in Hebrew, they heard him. It connected with them, and they got quiet. Watch this. Paul had acquired, obviously, the ability to speak in Hebrew. He had learned Hebrew from a boy. But as a, as a Greek citizen, as a, as, a, as a Roman citizen, he had also learned the language of Greek. Paul, by the way, if there had been an IQ test back in that day, I would love to have known his score. When you read about him, you read about his teaching, his learning, his abilities. He was a, a phenomenal person. And so he had learned Greek as well. He had learned Hebrew as well. And, and so it's these languages he had learned earlier in his life that are now being used to even give him a hearing. So can I suggest to you that at times God will use abilities we have acquired in the past to use right now in the present for his glory. Abilities 
we have acquired in the past. Some of you are looking back at things you learned when you were younger. I know some of you students are in classes right now and you're going, I can't possibly imagine how I would ever use this. And no, you can't, but guess what? You don't need to. God knows what you're learning. So some of you are sitting here today with things you learned in the past and you're not exactly sure why you learned them. I'll be honest with you, I'm the same way. But make no mistake about it and hear this. By the power of God and through His Son, Jesus Christ, God will oftentimes take things you learned in the past that maybe you never thought you would use again. And He can use those things in the present to glorify Himself, to win the lost, to equip the saved. In the fall quarter of 1991, that was back when colleges were on the quarter systems. Back in the fall quarter of 1991... I was a senior in college. I would graduate that spring. I was in a class under Dr. William Becker called Organization and Administration. And in that class, we were learning to uh, operate and oversee and run large um, departments, particularly in the public sector and government. And one of the areas we looked at specifically was, was something like a city recreation department and how it runs and how it's budgeted and how it's set up. So our major project that quarter was a, uh, developing an entire recreation plan, department, and budget for what we called the YIF-NIF Parks and Recreation Department. It was a make-believe Parks and Recreation Department, but we were given a certain amount you take this amount and you develop an entire recreation department budget through it. And so we developed the programs, we developed what personnel would be there, the facilities, the costs, and then we put it down in a written budget. We listed out a, a, a document that gave the budget as a whole, but we also had to, for each department, justify that department, justify that ministry. And whether it was youth sports, or whether it was senior adult activities, or whether it was youth arts and crafts, or the personnel area, we had to justify each thing, lay the budget out, and we put together a unified budget. By the way, believe it or not, I still have that project. I can't believe it. I still have it, but it's been around a long time. And I got to tell you, I, 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 William Becker is now at Virginia Wesleyan College, and uh, <clears throat> I was going to email him the other day and tell him how I've used this until I noticed that he gave me a B on this project. <laughs> and now I'm really going to talk to him. But anyway, so we put together this project, and when I graduated Georgia Southern, stuck this in a box with other projects and papers I had done, didn't think about it again. So two years later, two years later, I was a 23-year-old church planter starting a brand new church. And in the first year of that church that, that uh, I planted, which by the way, I'll, I'll, I'll begin tonight in revival at that church, Living Hope Baptist Church, out on the edge of Byron. I'll begin a, a series of revival services starting tonight through Wednesday. But anyway, we started that church in August of 1993. And in a new church plant, um, basically that first year, we just operated out of the church's checkbook. <laughs> if we had money in the checkbook, we bought stuff. If we didn't, we didn't. I mean, it just kind of operated like that. But after a year, we decided it would be a good idea to set in place a budget, kind of a unified budget for that coming year. Now, I know some of you who have been operating on church budgets for years can't imagine <coughs> not having a budget, but when you begin a church... When you got, you know, $47 in the account, you really don't need a budget for that. So, so by the end of the first year, we had saved some money, put some money aside, and we decided it would be good to put together a unified budget based upon the previous year's income and anticipated income and put together that budget. So we had someone from the Georgia Baptist Convention come in and sit down with us, myself and about three of my leaders. And I realized when we sat down in that room to talk about the budget, and to begin to develop it, that we could then present to the church and vote it in, all that kind of good stuff, I realized that a couple of my leaders were not that familiar with unified budgets. They were not that familiar with them. But guess who was? I was. 
I was only because two years earlier in a class I never thought I would refer to again, in a project that I never thought would do any good. When, when, when we put together this project, my senior year in college, I was already preaching a lot. In fact, a lot of Sundays out of every month, I was preaching in areas all around Statesboro, and I could start naming cities all around their churches I preached at. And I realized then that I wanted to preach. I was pretty sure I wanted to pastor. So when we did this project, I did not connect the two. Honestly, I didn't think a thing about this. I thought I was doing the project, got finished, put it aside. But two years later, I'm sitting around a table with a Georgia Baptist Convention representative, and several of my leaders, and a couple of them aren't really familiar with unified budgets, and I'm going, I get what that is. I know what that is. I understand it. How? Because of a project I had done two years earlier, something I never thought I would even think about again. And I said, Lord, thank you. <laughs> thank you that, you know what, I probably took that class because it was just, it, it, it filled a category that I needed when I took that class. I, I doubt I went in and went, hmm, you know, I think I'll take this class. It looks good. <laughs> It'll really help me two years from now. It's probably one of those things I had a category, I had to fill it with a class, and it had to be a certain time and certain day. Oh, here's the only class that'll work. Bang. Let me take this. Some of you understand what I'm talking about. Sometimes you just got to do that. What I did not know was the sovereign hand of God directed me to that class, sent me into that class, caused me to do a project where I began to understand what it meant to put together a budget for, a, for an organization or a program or an agency in such a way that when I got to starting a church, when I got to putting together a budget, I understood it. Ladies and gentlemen, can I suggest to you that there are abilities you have acquired through the years. I don't know what they are. Maybe you haven't thought about them in a while, but I'll tell you this. They are not wasted. The sovereign God of the universe can use them. I don't know the things, by the way, young people or adults. I don't know the things you're learning right now. But please do not assume that the thing you're learning right now is being wasted. You have no idea how God might use that thing again in your future. I don't know what math, what music, what instrument, what function or ability God is teaching you right now. But I'm telling you, who knows? Who knows what God might do in the future, which suggests then to me, be all in. If, you, if you're learning something, if you're in a class, please don't say, you know what, I don't need this class, this is a waste, I'm just going to kind of skate through it. Be all there, because who knows what God might do with what you learn there? Who knows? Look at verse 1 in chapter 22. <clears throat> Paul stands up speaking in Hebrew, and he says, brothers and fathers. Now, that is important because that was a Hebraic uh, introduction to a formal address. So he's not just winging it here. He's standing up, he's speaking Hebrew, and he's speaking to them now as if he's making a formal address. I'm going to begin to read through this next section. It's a long section. I'm not going to comment much on it, but I want you to see it. Because before we start it, know this, <clears throat> beginning in verse 2 all the way through verse 21, it is, as, it is as effective of an example on how to do a personal testimony as any passage in the book of Acts. That's what I'm just saying. <clears throat> you want to know how to lay out and organize a personal salvation testimony? You know, in our, in our new member course, one of the things that we require is people write out their personal salvation testimony. Right, Dr. Dan? And one of the reasons we do that is to make sure you have a personal salvation testimony to write out. And if you don't, then there may be a problem. But here is a great example of how to put it together. Verse 2. And when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. Then he said, I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous toward God as you all are today. Now, pause there. This goes all the way down through verse 5. Verses 3 through 5 are what we might say Paul's life, his early life. His life as a child and coming all the way up to pre-salvation. 
If you're going to do a personal salvation testimony, the first part of it is going to be your life before Christ. Now look at verse 6. Now it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon, suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, verse 6 all the way through verse 13, you may have already read this back earlier in the book of Acts. This is Paul's conversion. This is the, the, the day, the moment when Paul was actually converted. If you are going to do a personal salvation testimony, then what you want is the first part of it is my life before Christ. The second part of it is that, that time period, that event, that day, that time frame where I came to know Christ as my Savior, where I was converted. That's kind of the second part of a personal salvation testimony. Paul lays it out right here. And then pick up in verse 14. Then he said, the God of our fathers has chosen you. That is, Paul is saying, this is what God said to me. The God of our fathers has chosen you, that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth, for you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins and calling in the name of the Lord... Now it happened when I, Paul, this is Paul speaking about himself, when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I was in a trance and saw him saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. Now pause there. All the way through verse 21, what we have is Paul's life from the point of conversion up until about the time that he's speaking to the Jews here. And if you have a personal salvation testimony... To, to write out, or maybe, maybe, you've, maybe you've never done that before. Let me suggest that the first part is your life before Christ. The second part is, is that set of events and circumstances and time frame where you came to Christ. And then the third part of that personal salvation testimony is saying, this is what God has done in my life since that moment of conversion. Because if you say, I know that I've been saved, but there's nothing you can tell that God's done in your life since conversion, there's a problem. <laughs> and so that's three parts to a personal salvation testimony. Now, I don't know how many of you out there, this is kind of a parenthetical uh, conversation to, to the message itself. If any of you out there would say, Pastor Johnny, I've, I've, never, I've never really kind of sat down and done that, or maybe I have and I've struggled with it. Brother Gary, raise your hand. Brother Gary Williams, raise your hand. This is the man right here. If you want to know more effectively how to do it, you talk to him after the service, and he will sit down and help you learn how to write that out. And not only that, He'll help you learn how to have you know, your 90-second version of your personal salvation testimony. Because sometimes if you're, if you're talking with someone about Christ, you don't have time to go into the 10-minute version, right? But, but then there's also kind of the longer version of that along the way. But, but honestly, I, I have used my 90-second version uh, 10 times for every 11 times I've shared my personal testimony. Because oftentimes it's in a place where we don't have a lot of time and I just share my personal salvation testimony. That's what Paul does here. He doesn't really have a lot of time. He's standing before a rowdy group of people. But it's verse 21 that is the kicker. And we'll go there in just a second. But ladies and gentlemen, are you ready? God will, he may, and he will use experiences you have encountered he can and he will use experiences we have encountered for his glory, for his purposes, and for the gospel in our lives. God will use many experiences we have, we have encountered for his glory. Experiences. Now, the greatest experience is your personal salvation. You know, when I was younger, um, we, we moved to southern Indiana, and, and uh, from the time I was 6 until I was 12 years old, we lived up in southern Indiana in the community we lived in, was a community of German Catholics. And many of you know my father who passed away a, a decade or so ago. Um, he, was, he was a heavy drinker the whole time I grew up. I loved him, and uh, he was my dad, but he was a heavy alcoholic all of my life until just a couple of years before he died of cancer. And so when we, when we moved up, we had pretty much been kind of a part of the, a Baptist church in East Tennessee, which is where I'm originally from and where my family is from. But when we moved to southern Indiana... And my dad kind of discovered that you could go to a church that had keg booths at its picnics. And so 
he was all for that. So we joined the Catholic Church, and I'm not trying to be cute or, well, I'm just, that's, that's kind of what drew him there, to be honest with you. And so we, we got involved in that, and I was baptized in the Catholic Church and uh, took First Communion. I was an altar boy, wore the robes, ring the bells. For those of you who may know what I'm talking about, for those of you who don't, just trust me. And grew up for all those years uh, as, as a Roman Catholic child growing up. We moved to Georgia, and when I was about 13 years old, I began to attend a church with a friend of mine because of a youth lock-in. <laughs> youth lock-ins, the uh, greatest reason youth pastors have been run out of ministry in the history of youth ministry, youth lock-ins. No, I'm just kidding, not really. <laughs> so it, he invited me to a youth lock-in, and, and we went to the youth lock-in, and then that next Sunday I went to church with him, and I kind of started going, just attending church with him. It was Second Baptist Church here in Warner Robins. And I remember during that time, it was a very short period of time, just a few months, where I began to, to, to at least consciously hear the term born again. Now, I'm sure at some point in my life, I had heard the term born again. Jimmy Carter had used the term born again when he was president. and all. But, but I don't remember it meaning anything to me until that time. And I remember hearing the term born again. And I remember even as an eighth grader thinking, I know what born again means now. And it does not apply to me. And so I remember thinking, Lord, Lord, when does the Lord hear me when I pray? I remember thinking, how do I know I'm going to go to heaven? And I began to get those questions answered. Now, I cannot explain this, but from the time I was in the eighth grade until the time I graduated high school, I was aware of my need of salvation. I was. I was aware of it. But, but for the next five years of my life, I found ways, continued to attend church there. A whole family began to attend church there. And finally, right after high school, I remember my senior year in high school, a football player, and I was involved in track, and just kind of on the outside would be just a, a great student time, all, all that kind of good stuff. And yet in my mind, I knew that I was lost, and sometimes <clears throat> I would lay in bed at night, and I could, I could still picture this. I could picture laying in bed and thinking, if something happened to me tonight or tomorrow or soon, I would spend eternity in hell. It's like, well, Pastor, why... Why didn't you go ahead and trust Christ? I cannot explain that. I've never been able to explain why I would wait. I don't understand it. I just waited. But it was about three weeks after my graduation from high school and the last possible youth retreat that I could go on, because you, know, you can go on that youth retreat just after you graduate, and that's the last one. Then you got to go on up to college and career and that kind of stuff. So I went on that youth retreat, and it was Tuesday night. The guy who was preaching preached a message called the birthmarks of believers, and he gave six birthmarks of what it looks like when you're saved, and, and I, there was none of them applied to me. Maybe one of them, maybe. And that night, I, during the invitation, I got up and I went out and sitting by a pool at the Surfside 7 Retreat in Panama City, Florida, <clears throat> I gave my heart and life to Christ. Now, since then, I, quite frankly, I've never been one of those since that day that has, has really wrestled with doubt about my salvation or whether I'm truly born again. It was such a shift in my life <clears throat> that there's literally never. And within a couple of weeks, I, I was aware I was about to go off to college to Georgia Southern. It was within a couple of weeks <clears throat> I became aware that God wanted to use me somehow, some way in full time kind of ministry later on. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. <clears throat> Uh, as I was at Georgia, so I think I was declared a business major or something. But since that day, God began to open up <clears throat> doors for me to teach the Bible. He get, began to open up doors for me to connect with Christian friends. And since that day, he, he's, he's used me. He's ministered through me. He's been gracious. A year after I was saved, I led my, now, my then girlfriend, my now wife, to the Lord, and she was saved. It was part of her being baptized. God has been very, very gracious. Ladies and gentlemen, that's my personal salvation testimony that I just gave to you. That is the greatest experience of my life, and God uses it still today. An experience I encountered, <clears throat> he uses it still today. Now, your personal salvation is not your only experience, but it is your greatest. And God will use it if you will allow him to. Now look at verse 22. And they listened to him until this word. Once Paul said, God told me to go preach to the Gentiles, the Jews to whom he was speaking, that's it. <laughs> that's kind of where the, the, the line ends. They ain't listening no more. And so they say, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. That sounds a little melodramatic to me, but you know, hey, that's the way they felt. 
Verse 23, as they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust in the air, too bad people didn't have cell phones back then. You want to talk about viral. <laughs> the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks and said that he should be examined under scourging, which is not a, an enjoyable activity. Scourging, it's a leather whip with nine tails. Oftentimes they attach <clears throat> sharp objects to it and they whip you with it. It's, it's a bad deal. So that he might know why they shouted so against him. And as they bound him with thongs, and that's just leather straps, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, just very matter-of-factly, I love this. Paul says, uh, question, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? Oh. <laughs> This soldier is about to violate a huge Roman law, a very important Roman law. Look at the response. Verse 26, when the centurion heard that, he went and told the commander saying, Whoa, take care what you do, for this man is a Roman. Then the commander came and said to him, uh, Tell me, are you a Roman? Paul said, Yes, I am. Very matter of fact. I love the fact that that Paul is using the government institutions, but not for himself, for the gospel. It's a distinct difference for me using government institutions and government services strictly for myself and, and laws and legalities and using it for the gospel. Verse 28, the commander answered with a large sum. I obtained this. That is the commander said, so I bought my citizenship. Paul said, really, I didn't. <laughs> I was born a citizen, which, which kind of in the order of importance, that being born a Roman citizen was ahead of buying your citizenship. So all of a sudden, Paul went from a guy he was about to scourge to a guy he's now kind of below in terms of citizenship. That's a, that's a quick shift in status. And so, verse 29 then immediately those who were about to examine him withdrew from him. Oh. <laughs> well, what, what do you say, Paul, to get the guy who's about to beat you <laughs> to stop and draw back? If he had threatened them with his fist, they'd just beat down on him. If he had threatened them with force, they would have taken care of him. But instead he used, watch this, he used a status that God had given him from birth <clears throat> to turn this whole thing around. Verse, uh, verse 29, that immediately those who were about to examine him withdrew from him. And the commander was also afraid after he found out that he was a Roman. And because he had bound him, understand something. <clears throat> now the entire weight of the Roman government stood behind Paul. All because of a status he received at birth. Decades before he would ever preach the gospel. Decades before he would ever be struck blind and converted on the road to Damascus. <clears throat> there are places God is putting you right now. It may be a place you don't want to be. It may be a place you do want to be. But no, make no mistake about it. There are places God is putting you right now. Statuses <laughs> he is securing for you that you cannot possibly imagine how he might use in the future. Paul <clears throat> gained the status of citizen at birth. His parents could not possibly have known what was going to happen. Paul gained the status of citizen at birth. Even as a child, even as a young man, he grew up Jewish. He, was, <clears throat> he said as a young man he was excelling in the Jewish faith well beyond his contemporaries. Even up as a teenager, as an older teenager, a, a young adult... He could not have imagined what was about to take place. He was about the same age as Jesus, by the way. So when Paul got converted, he was probably 30, 31, 32, 33 years old. So for three decades, he grew up thinking, I'm going to be a Jewish leader. I'm going to be a Pharisee. I'm going to be on the Sanhedrin. And all of a sudden, bam, it changed. And yet, a status that God had given three, dec three decades earlier was still coming into play. Not for Paul's benefit. Well, some for Paul's benefit but really for the gospel. I don't know what status God's giving you in your life. And whether you're 4 or 5 or 15 or 25 or 35 or 85, don't assume 
<clears throat> that that's just accidental or happenstance. You cannot possibly imagine how God might use that in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, God will not waste our past experiences. He is sovereignly efficient, and He will use them to glorify Himself and to proclaim His name. Nothing is wasted in your lives. When I was a junior in high school, <clears throat> it was the fall of 1986. I was a junior in high school, and I had a very brief conversation with a young lady in my grade whose name was Melissa. Melissa. It was a conversation that probably lasted all of 90 seconds. You say, Pastor, how do you even remember that? Here's why I remember it. Because Melissa was telling me in that 90-second conversation about a young lady who was partial to me, kind of like me. What I did not know at that time... <clears throat> is that young lady she was telling me about later in that fall would become my girlfriend. What I did not know at that point was that young lady who became my girlfriend would eventually become my fiance. <clears throat> what the, what the young lady who eventually became my fiance has become my wife of 27 and a half years, has become the mother of our three children, and now our oldest is married and now living out in Florida with her husband, Caleb, and they started their family. She's been by my side in the churches I've pastored, where I've ministered. Uh, we, we have been together. She is my heartbeat. How could I possibly have known in that 90-second conversation in the fall of 1986 what was going to come out of that? Here's the thing. I couldn't. There's no way I could have known that. But, oh, God, he is an efficient, sovereign God. You think you're somewhere right now? <clears throat> And you just feel like you're just kind of being wasted. Hey, yeah, Pastor, I just feel like there's more. Here's what you need to do. You need to say, Lord, you've got me where I am right now. And so I just want to be the best I can be where I am. Because who knows how you're going to use what I'm learning now? Who knows what I'm experiencing now, how you're going to use it in the future? For some of you, it is actually trials and difficulties you're walking through that God's going to use in the future. And he's going to use them in ways you don't even know about. And so I'm saying, how many of you are here today and God brought you to this place and you're lost? And you could point to 10 different decisions that were made or conversations had that brought you to this place today. And today you need to trust Christ as your Savior. And God's efficiency has brought you here today. And maybe you need to come and find out how to be saved. Maybe you're a believer just walking through a difficult time and you go, you know what? I, just, I don't understand it. Here's some good news. You don't need to understand it. You don't need to understand what you're walking through. All you need to do is get intimate with Jesus and walk with Him. And I promise you, He'll take care of all that stuff you don't understand. And you, you couldn't take care of it anyway, even if you knew what it was. And so maybe today you want to come and get before the Lord and begin to pray. Lord, help me just to walk in intimacy with you. <clears throat> Things are coming up in your lives, some of you, that you could not possibly anticipate. Some really good things, some challenging things, some trials, some victories. But guess what? God's going to use them if you will trust Him. If you don't trust Him, He's still going to use a lot of them. <clears throat> you just don't get the joy of experiencing it. <laughs> so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to invite you to come and respond as the Lord leads. Maybe he's done some things in your life to bring you to become a part of this fellowship. A series of conversations, circumstances, whatever it is, you come. Father, right now, in Jesus' name, Lord, help us to obey you in these moments right now. You stand.